This is chapter three, ca chapter one, KSU three. This is your third installment of um, lectures with Mrs. Maddie. So uh, this one is mostly on things that are in your book, but I give you some more examples than your book offers. So you can just kind of write down those examples if you already have the definitions pretty solid. And uh, you should have for every time we do this, you should have about a half a page that I give you in the lecture and you should have two to two and a half pages of notes from the books, okay? So some of us are not being specific enough in our book um, notes. Some of us are only turning in one or the other, so we need to do both and that's how it should look. Okay, so if you're doing the note guides, just keep doing the note guides and then just add like a half a page from the, the lecture notes, either on the bottom or on the back. Okay, and then just FYI, I am not going to do one of these for key issue four, since key issue four is pretty straightforward and there's just a couple of things that I'm going to hit in class with you guys. So no video for chapter one, key issue four, spread the word. Okay, so today we're talking about diffusion and globalization. If you have already read the Gangnam Style article, some of this might seem familiar, and if you haven't, like this is the background information that you really need to understand that article and to answer those questions. So, if you haven't done it, definitely do it after you watch this and read this chapter, section of the chapter. So, globalization is basically when things spread on a global level, right? And our word for spreading information or objects or some sort of culture in geography is diffusion. So we're talking about diffusion, so how things are spread, and then kind of the aftermath of all of that is globalization. So textbook definition, expansion of natural resources, agriculture, manufacture commodities, that's just a nice way of saying things that are made, services, people, information, money, culture, and even pollution on a worldwide scale. Um, and we are seeing more and more, partially because of use of technology, uh, places are becoming more and more globalized, right? So like things that you find in America, you can find in many other places because of globalization. So globalization is increasing as a whole. So um, there's two kind of different types of globalization that we look at throughout the year. One is the globalization of the economy and one is the globalization of culture. So economically, globalization means that we're becoming more and more interconnected and interdependent. Um, and then globalization of culture is basically the same thing. So the more often that you go to different places outside of the US, you will notice that a lot of things we have here back home exist in other places that you visit, okay? Um, let's see. So when we talk about economic globalization, um, sometimes we're talking about specialization of the global economy. So uh, this map, and if you can remember what type of map this is, I'm giving you a second to figure it out. Graduated symbol or proportional symbol map. Um, this is showing you parts of the world where coffee is grown. So you will notice that not a lot of coffee is grown in Russia. In the United States, we grow some coffee, but we don't grow very much coffee, okay? So that means that these places are the only places growing co coffee, but because it is globalized, we can still assume that other places drink coffee. So definitely in the US, we drink coffee. I drink like three cups a day. So most of the coffee that I drink, however, comes from South America or Mexico, okay? Sometimes from Africa. So even though we have specialized locations for certain types of economies in different parts of the world, that product still spreads throughout the globe. So it's economic globalization, okay? Um, cultural globalization is something more like this, right? This is a building in China that obviously has a Starbucks, right? So that's showing us that um, even though Starbucks is an American company, we can find it almost anywhere else we go. So a lot of people who critique and criticize globalization think that it's kind of a shame that places are starting to lose their identities because everywhere is starting to look the same. 
okay? So that's like a major critique of some people who are kind of against globalization. Okay, like here's another example. Times Square and Tokyo. Aside from the writing, um, you probably almost couldn't tell which one is which, right? Like look how similar these are today. So we have downtown Tokyo on the right and Times Square in New York City on the left. Okay, and then distribution. Oh, so we're kind of switching here to um, some more spatial vocabulary. So on that kind of orangey goldenrod sheet that I gave you guys that has a lot of spatial vocabulary listed for you. So I'm going to go over some of those terms here. And basically these terms are connected because when we talk about diffusion and how things have spread, when we're talking about the geographical aspects of that, we oftentimes use this type of lingo to describe that. So. Um, distribution has to do with how things are arranged on Earth's surface. And the three things we look at when we talk about distribution are density, concentration, and pattern. Okay? So density has to do with how frequently something is occurring. Concentration has to do with how close together um, those objects are. And then pattern has to do with the way in which those objects are arranged. So if that's way over your head, here's a visual. So if we look over here on density, we can say that the density for this is about six houses per, let's say that this is a square mile, okay? The density for B would be more than that, right? So we would say there's this many houses per square mile. Um, here's where it gets a little tricky. So density is something that we say, but then something else that we might throw in there is densely, how densely populated something is. And that has more to do with concentration, okay? So these houses are far apart. These houses are close together. Because these are far apart, we would say that they are sparsely concentrated. They are far away from one another. It is sparse. Because these are really close together, we would say that these are densely concentrated. They are close together. It is dense. We could also say this one is densely po populated, right, because they're very close together. Um, so that gets a little tricky. So you can say density has to do with how much are occurring in the space, but then also an adjective that we use to say that something is very highly concentrated, like there's a lot of it in one area, we would say it's dense. So that gets a little tricky. It just takes a little practice. And then over here on pattern, so we would say we have these six houses in a straight line, right? That's one way that they are arranged. So that's a pattern there. And then this one kind of goes in like a zigzag, right? So we would say these houses are arranged in a zigzag pattern along the street, okay? Any questions? Ask me in class, but you're going to get some practice with this. Okay, um, here's another, a couple of examples. So we have uh, Major League Baseball teams in 1952 and 2012. So 1952 is this map. So we could say that they are densely concentrated within the East Coast and a little bit, the Northeast and a little bit of the North Midwest up here. Okay. Um, and then they become, down here in 2012, a little bit more sparsely um, located, right? They're not so close together. They're less dense. And there really isn't a concentration anymore, right? Like before, we could say they were concentrated in the Northeast. But now, since they're sparsely populated all over the United States, we can say that they're, they're not very concentrated. They're sparse. Okay. It just takes a little practice. It's okay if it's still a little confusing. Um, okay, here's another one. So these are, this is a picture of the United States at night. Where there is more light, there is more population. So we could say, again, that they are more densely populated in the north um, eastern part of the U.S. up here. Less so kind of um, in what we would call the corn belt and the wheat belt over here, like Nebraska and areas like that. Uh, but then again, we have some densely populated areas on the coasts of California. Um, we could say 
that there are patterns, right? We notice where there are clusters um, on coastlines. So we could say that there's a pattern when it comes to coastlines, right? We see all these little clusters. Um, so there you go. You could probably come up with a lot of different ways to use that vocabulary to plug into this map, but I don't want to spend the whole time on it. Okay, um, a hearth is a really easy definition to get down. It's just the original place from which something diffuses, okay? So if something starts, it's let's say we start a trend at Spanish Springs High School and we're the first ones to do it, and then it spreads throughout the country. Spanish Springs High School would be the hearth, right? Um, these are examples of, in history, some cultural hearths, the Nile River, right? Ancient Egypt, lots of culture came out of that. The Indus River, Mesopotamia, which is around Iraq and Iran. Um, some of the earliest civilizations were spread from that, so we consider that a cultural hearth, right? Uh, Facebook started at Harvard University. Um, and then surfing came from Hawaii. Those are the hearths, okay? All right. So now we're looking at types of diffusion. And like I said, diffusion is just the spread of something, right? For something to diffuse, it means it is spreading. So we have relocation diffusion, and we have expansion diffusion, and there are three types of expansion diffusion. Hierarchical diffusion, which is also a vocab word in a skills class, right? Hierarchy, contagious diffusion, and stimulus diffusion. So relocation diffusion is when something spreads because something has been relocated, right? So an example would be the slave, culture from slaves that they brought from Africa. They were forcefully moved to the United States and to different parts of North America and South America. And they took that culture with them and spread it once they got here, right? So that's relocation diffusion, okay? Um, sometimes religion is spread this way, although it can also spread other ways that we'll talk about in a second. Um, so that is when literally something spreads because the people who have it are getting up and moving to a different location, okay? Relocation diffusion. When we talk about migrations, we will talk a lot about relocation diffusion. Um, then we have these three types of expansion diffusion. And what's different is that it's not really because of relocation. Um, it's more like things just kind of spread over land masses and different um, venues just like that, okay? So let's see. The first one is hierarchical diffusion. So that happens in two ways. So one way, sometimes we talk about something starting in a big city and then moving to smaller cities and eventually out to rural areas and small towns, right? So a lot of times fashion trends do this. Um, like in New York City, everybody will, I don't know, buy a, oh, how about a blue shirt? It's like cool to wear a blue shirt in New York City. Then all of a sudden, some of the suburbs around New York City start wearing blue shirts, and then they start moving out into the rural areas. So that's hierarchical diffusion. Or sometimes important people will spread things, and that's still hierarchical diffusion. So let's say that um, somebody in power makes it a law that on Tuesdays you have to eat salmon for dinner, okay? So that important person said that that is going to happen, and then it is spreading down kind of the chain of command, right? So that would also be hierarchical diffusion. Um, other examples they gave you, hip-hop, rap music, a lot of that started in the big cities and then spread. Fashion trends oftentimes spread that way. Contagious diffusion um, is when the diffusion is so widespread that it's really hard to determine a hearth. And it's so rapid um, that it really can't be any other kind of diffusion. It's contagious, kind of like a cold, right? Like sometimes we don't know where we got it from. We just know that we have it. Um, so diseases are good examples of contagious diffusion. These graphics that I have right here from you, this is AIDS cases in 1981, 93, 2006, and then kind of all together, um, 1981 to 2006. So these three maps kind of combined over here, okay? So the spread of AIDS there is diffusing um, 
via contagious diffusion. Information on the internet often goes that way too. Sometimes it's hard to find who originally posts something and before you know it overnight everybody has seen this meme or this vine, is that a thing anymore? Or just things on the internet spread so quickly sometimes that we would call that contagious diffusion. Stimulus diffusion is the spread of an underlying principle but with a twist, okay? So something spreads, but different places are going to do that differently, okay? So like computers kind of look different from place to place early on. Um, surfers have kind of diffused to different places. So like skateboarding, if you don't have water, kind of turned into skateboarding. If you had snow, kind of turns into snowboarders. Um, McDonald's menu choices, I meant to show you that. I'm going to go back really quick because this is a really good example of stimulus diffusion. Okay. Switch gears here really quick. Feel free to go get a drink of water go to the bathroom. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry, you can tell I'm kind of new at this, right? Okay, we'll check in on that in a second. It's going to take a second to do that. Okay. Um, go back to... Okay, so... Those are the three types of diffusion. I'll go back to the McDonald's stuff at the end, but that'll be an example of uh, stimulus diffusion. So um, when we look at diffusion, we also need to think about how much and how little things um, spread. And one thing we do when we look at that, like at things like that, is we look at distance decay. So distance decay is the theory that the greater the distance, the less important that thing is going to be, okay? So let me show you this. So um, think about this. If you were going to just go pick up some milk, you are most likely going to go to someplace really close by, right? Like you could just go to 7-Eleven down the street and get some milk because everybody has it, okay? So Milk could be something that's part of your daily diet, so it's really important to you, so you're going to go somewhere really close, right? And if it was really hard to get milk, you probably wouldn't have that as big a part of your diet, right? You wouldn't go super far to get that thing. Um, let's say that you need something kind of specific from the grocery store. Let's say something like sun-dried tomatoes. You're making pasta, you want to get some sun-dried tomatoes. It's likely that the gas station on the corner is not going to have those, right? You're not going to go to the convenience store. You're going to have to maybe go a little further away from you and go to the grocery store, okay? It's okay that that's a little further out because sun-dried tomatoes are probably not as important as milk in your diet, right? Um, let's say that now you need to get, um, I should have come up with examples beforehand. <laughs> okay, let's say you need to get a new office chair, right? You're at work and you don't really like your chair. You would like to get another one. So maybe the nearest office depot is like 10 miles away, but it's the only place that's going to have it. So you're willing to go a little further out to a superstore or department store to get that thing. That's okay because it's not as important to you as these staples possibly in your diet, right? So what this is showing you is that things that you use every day, things that are important to you, um, are going to be close to you. And if they're not, they're probably not going to be that important to you. And as you get further out, um, these things probably become less important to you as we get further and further out, right? Like out here, past the department store and superstore might be something like a rock concert or a major league sporting event, okay? So like the Giants or the A's for baseball are the closest places we can go um, if you want to go to a major league baseball game, and those are all the way in the Bay Area. But we don't really need to go to a baseball game to survive, right? So it makes sense that it's all the way out here. Okay, but here's the thing. So we have distance decay, so that's that theory, but then space-time compression, also sometimes called space-time convergence, I think I put both on your key terms, um, 
says that, yes, all of that is true, distance decay, but now that we have advanced technology and transportation, that's not as true as it used to be, right? Um, like, it's a, it's a lot easier now to talk to your relatives that are living in Hawaii because um, we have Facebook and phones and things like that, right? So you might talk to your grandma in Hawaii every single day, and she might be really important in your life, even though she's really far away, okay? Another example would be the Arab Spring, which we'll talk about more when we get to the migration unit. But basically, a lot of the meeting places for the protests were sent out via Twitter and Facebook. So even though people were far away, they were able to organize in a single place just because the word got out so much easier, okay? Um, so all of these things kind of lead to space-time convergence or space-time compression, okay? Um, let's see about McDonald's really quick. Okay, so stimulus diffusion. Here are some things you can get in different places in McDonald's. So globalization, cultural globalization, all these places have um, McDonald's, but they all do it a little differently. Okay, so in Hong Kong, we have Oreo, um, like milkshakes and stuff like that. In Italy, you can get a sandwich with Nutella in the center at McDonald's. In Ohio, you can get a Sriracha Big Mac. I don't know if they have those here or not. I don't, not a frequenter of McDonald's. In Japan, this actually sounds really good to me, you can get pumpkin spice french fries. Yummy. Uh, you can get chocolate potatoes in Japan. Japan really seems to like sweet stuff, which is kind of funny. Um, McRice Burger, so instead of a bun, it's like a rice patty in Singapore. We don't have to go through all of these. I think you guys get the point. Uh, sausage, egg, and twisty pasta in Hong Kong. You can get macarons in France and Austria. So what it's showing you is that, yes, we have McDonald's almost everywhere, but you can see that based on different cultural tastes throughout the world, they're going to have different things, right? Here we go. In India, um, this is basically potato and not meat. And that makes sense because there's a lot of vegetarians in India. That's a big part of their culture. A lot of them think it's wrong to eat animals um, because they're Hindu. Okay? So um, that's all I have for you today. So you guys, uh, make sure you bring any questions. You can go to this website and look at more funny McDonald's food if you want to. Remember, this is an example of stimulus diffusion. Uh, and I will see you in class.